Okay, uh, like I was saying, chapter one video is posted in Brightspace, and um, there's also a uh, course tour video that I made kind of early on, so it may be incomplete, but I went through everything again for this second video, um, probably with a little bit more information, and the course was built up a little bit from that point. Um, so if you come in person, you'll get hard copies of everything. Uh, but everything I give out in class, hard copy is uh, in the learning management system, in this case, Brightspace. So you can find anything that I give out in class in Brightspace and it's modular. So module one will be exam one materials and everything is there under that one module, uh, including the exam. Um, let's see, I always forget something. Uh, if I did, it'll come to me later. So today we're just gonna run through chapter two. Chapter one was sort of a really uh, uh, scraping surface description of chemistry and, and science in general. Now we're gonna get into uh, topics of measurement. There we go, measurement calculations. Well, let me turn this into a slideshow. Jump on our horse and ride off in every direction. Okay. Um, let's see. I'm gonna I'm gonna pin mine, make mine big, so I can see what's being discussed. Here we go. Yeah, that's everything. Oh, I am gonna cut the front lights out. I think we get a better picture that way. A recording. All right. So these three chapters are on the first exam. We're going to talk about uh, measurements, calculations, and then we're going to talk about matter. In other words, the stuff that the universe is made of and is going to be our focus for chemistry from here on. Uh, then when we get into chapters four and five, we'll get into the nuts and bolts of chemistry, like the vocabulary like the symbols for all the elements and so forth. But today we're gonna to talk about measurements and um, calculations. And this is just an outline. Uh, it usually don't stop here for very long because we're gonna to get to it anyway. <clears throat> but whenever we make measurements in, uh, in uh, chemistry or any of the sciences, uh, let me get a fresh marker. Should have done this before. You know, see if it marks. Yeah, there we go. Okay. Sooner or later, um, in any of the sciences, chemistry, physics, biology, whatever they happen to be, you're eventually going to have to take some kind of a measure. Um, and we, our, our first inclination is to jump, when measurement, we say measurement, we jump to length, which is normal. Um, but measurement is, is broader than that. And when a measurement is made, 99% um, of the time, the measurement will include a number, which we call the scalar, and a unit. In this case, our example is a centimeter. So this represents one centimeter. Of course, that's it's a lot bigger than a real centimeter, but this is for illustration purposes only. And we have the number and the unit. Um, and the unit of measure determines the magnitude of the measurement. In other words, in this example, the centimeter is bigger than the millimeter. So if you have one, if I just say, um, I am, let's see, uh, 70, I'm 71. You might think I'm saying I'm 71 years old. 
I didn't say that. I just said 71. Actually, what I mean is I'm 71 inches tall. So without the unit, you don't know. Uh, if I were in Europe or any place else in the world, actually, I'd uh, report my height in centimeters. And I don't happen to know what it is. We can calculate it, but let's save that for later. Um, the unit of measure is uh, not just important, it's essential. Now, I said 99% of the measurements have a number and a unit. There are instruments now that uh, I call black boxes. You put your sample in and it spits out a number. You don't know what's going on inside. <laughs> I always sort of shied away from those types of instruments because I want to know how that number was arrived. Um, anyway, they can give you a number with no units. And if you understand how the instrument performs its function, then that number might mean something to you. But for 99% of the time, and for this class, all of the time, the numbers, a measurement is gonna have a number in it. Okay, you got, you got your first dose of my winded nature. I just talk and talk and talk. So it's a good thing we've got two hours to cover this topic. Um, this is known as a quantitative observation. When you make an observation about some uh, phenomenon in nature, uh, it could come in the form of uh, uh, this quantitative, which means you have a number and a unit, or it could be qualitative. Oh, we got someone else being in. Uh, oh no, that's just a re, that's a reconnect. Okay. Um, what we call qualitative observation. A qualitative observation, um, as opposed to a quantitative, is more descriptive. For instance, we might say what color it is, or we might say it's bigger than something else, or uh, it feels hot. So in those terms, if it feels hot, then we can use a thermometer and turn that qualitative observation into a quantitative observation by measuring the temperature. Okay. Um, now, some measurements are huge and some are extremely small. And if we use a standard decimal system, standard uh, decimal notation, um, our big numbers could cover like the whole board and the small numbers could too, but they have a decimal and then a bunch of numbers after them. So the system that we've devised to be more efficient in our expressions is called scientific notation. Now this is actually scientific notation is a subset of exponential notation. Right. So it's this covers a lot of ground and this is very specific. Exponential notation just means that when you write your number, and this is always in the decimal system, right? powers of 10. Um, when, you, when you write a big number, you might have the ones units, the tens, the hundreds, right? This is grade school stuff. So if we have a number that's got all four of these, like uh, four, five, six, five, then you know what each one of these represents. That's five. This is 60. This is 500. That's 4,000. Okay. <clears throat> but if it gets really big, then we may want to write that in, I shouldn't have erased it. We'll use this example. This we would, say is 93 million because there's thousands, uh, thousands, ten thousands, hundred thousands, millions, ten millions. So 93 million is this number. If we write that in uh, exponential notation, we 
we could say 9300 times 10 to something. Okay. So if we're going to go over to here, move the decimal, understood decimal from here, one, two, three, four. So we would store up those four places in the power of 10. And that 10 would represent 10,000. So ones, tens, hundreds, thousands. And it would give us uh, this number times that number. That's exponential notation. Scientific notation is more specific. It has one rule that exponential does not have. And that is this number, which is called the coefficient, must be between one and 10. If this number gets to 10, then you store that back up here in that power, and then this becomes more. So actually it's from one to less than 10. So this number then would be written, well, like it shows you here, 9.3 times 10 to the seven. 9.3 times 10 million would give you 93 million. But this number can be reduced to power of 10. Right, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven zeros, 10 to the seventh power. That is scientific notation. And it's all based upon the fact that this number right here must be between one and 10. Okay, that's how you go from standard notation to scientific notation. Uh, coefficient I identified, and that's the exponent. Okay, and I just told you what happens if the coefficient is exactly 10. If the coefficient becomes 10, then you reduce it. Let's just say, for example, you have 10 times 10 to the 7. You have to change this one, move that decimal over one more, that becomes 1 times 10 to the 8. Okay, so whatever you're going from standard notation to scientific notation, if you move the decimal to the left, you're storing up positive powers of 10. And that, um, I like to use estimation um, as a, a honesty tool. So if I, if I take this number and I say, this is uh, 9.3 times 10 to the seven, do I know that's right? Well, 10 to the seventh, 10 to the positive seventh is a massive number, just like this is a massive number. That helps me know that I'm on the right track. If I put a negative seventh there, that would be an extremely small number and it just wouldn't jump. It doesn't make any sense. If this is massive and that was small, then we went the wrong direction. Okay. That's a form of estimation. I use estimation a lot, and we'll, I'll, I'll give it to you in bits and pieces as we go. You got another one? Somebody must be. Oh, Melissa's on two. Sometimes I get two Zoomers uh, by the same name. If you're using um, uh, a video link and you can't get the audio to work, sometimes they call in on their cell phone and then get both at the same time. Okay, so this will probably make more sense if we start to use it. Work lots of problems. In fact, uh, I think I said this during the first video. Your two best friends in chemistry are curiosity. You always want to know why something happens or how it happens. Want to know more? That's good. And your second best friend is boredom. Because the way you learn chemistry is to work problems. If you work problems and lots of them, you become more familiar. And if you become too familiar, it's like, like a friend that spends too much time in your house. Eventually, you want to get rid of them. You're, you're bored with their company. If you're bored working chemistry problems, then you, pretty, you know them pretty well. <clears throat> okay. Uh, using scientific notation. Let's see. Well, that's true. Any number can be represented as a 
as a product of the coefficient to the power of 10. And it doesn't have to be positive, it can be negative. So very small numbers, and we'll have some examples in a second. Um, the number of places that you move the decimal will inform the power of 10. If you move from right to left, it's going to get bigger because the coefficients get smaller. So you got to put that information somewhere. You put it in a positive power of 10. Okay, here's an example. At 345, we move the decimal from here to places. So we store that information here, right? If this gets smaller, then that has to get bigger. When you go from here to here, you see this gets smaller to go to there. That means this has to get bigger. Uh, and it works the other way too. Say if we had um, uh, 0 0.0345, that. <laughs> So we would move the decimal place to the right, and this number would get bigger. The coefficient would get bigger, right? 3.45 is bigger than that number. So this has to get smaller by what? One, two moves. Minus two. Okay. There's some other examples here. Right? There are examples 0.067. So here the number is getting bigger for the coefficient, so that has to get smaller. So if you move the decimal to the right, that makes this one bigger. And this one has to be a negative power. Now, uh, in a few minutes, we're gonna go backwards. We're gonna take these numbers and make standard notation out of them. And there's really no mystery. It's like I said, if you take, if you take this number and make it smaller, that one has to get bigger. If you want it to disappear, then you can use up both of those places and move it to one, two, put a zero there and a decimal. Then you get that number back. And here, one of my pet peeves. I don't know, they must teach this in, in grade school or high school uh, to write a number like this uh, 0.0671. That's wrong. Anytime you have a zero floating out here on its own, it's got to be bracketed by another zero. I call those orphan decimals. If you give me an orphan decimal, then your answer's wrong. And I'm sorry, if you learned it that way in, from your public school teachers, then um, I have to get all of them in together in the room because I wouldn't want to tell each one individually and just tell them you're all wrong. Okay, so here's another example, 7,882. First of all, you gotta find out where the decimal is. The decimal sometimes is, is explicit, like our, our decimal number, 0 0.067, 0 0.0671, and sometimes it's understood. In this case, it's understood to be right there to the right of the two. Okay, now you can move the decimal. Once you know where it is, you can move the decimal to the left, one, two, three. So that makes the coefficient smaller. Power of 10 has to get bigger by three units. So it's 7.882 times 10 to the third power. Because you moved it three times, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. You're taking the ones, the tens, the hundreds, and stuffing them, well, actually, when you move it to the right, you're into the tens place. You're into the hundredth place. You're into the thousandth place. Because 10 to the third equals 1,000. 7.882 times 10 to the third here is that number. Okay. <clears throat> How about this big one? How about this small one? It looks big, but it's really small. Because we know it's small because it's got that decimal there and then lots of zeros to the right before you actually get to the non zero number. Okay, somebody else. I think somebody's having connection problems. They're dropping out and coming back. Um, 
let's see, let's be sure I'm recording. Is there a meeting? Yes. I've been known to go through a whole lecture and not record it. <laughs> <clears throat> so, after the class is over and I discover the mistake, I come back here all by myself and do the whole thing over again. <laughs> it takes a little less time because I've already gone through it once. Yeah. Okay, how about this one? We're going to move the decimal to the right, correct? So this number, the coefficient now is going to be getting bigger by one, two, three, four, five places. So if it gets bigger, power 10 gets smaller, 10 to the minus five. Right? So there's our coefficient and there's our power. Okay. Okay. Um, we did this already, just a refresher. Examples, um, this brings up a good point. I was talking about that black box example, instrument. You can get some instruments that will spit out the answer with units of measure that are not singular. In other words, they may be combinations of units of measure and the, the instrument does it all for you. This is an example of a, a compound unit. A joule is a unit of heat. And a second, of course, is unit of time. Well, joule second is a valid unit. It's just joules times seconds. And that gives you a different unit that you would have with joules alone or with seconds alone. Now this happens, to, actually this happens to be a physical constant. Right? Uh, your instrument can spit out the value with compound units, or you can get compound units from calculations. And I'll, we'll work on those in just a minute. Let's not uh, muddy the waters too much right now. Just recognize that you can have compound units and we'll leave it at that for this, for the moment. Okay. So one thing scientists had to do early on, modern scientists, um, was we had to gr agree on the units of measure that were going to be used and what they were going to measure and what they mean. So that if I tell you, um, well, I'm gonna have to use the English system because I don't know what my mass is in kilograms. Um, if I tell you I'm 205 pounds, you have sort of an intuition, an understanding of, of how much that is, because you know what a pound weighs. But scientists need to be more exact than that. We need to know exactly, in no uncertain terms, how big is a kilogram. A kilogram is what's called a fundamental unit. In other words, it is defined. And there is somewhere, there is a standard kilogram. And all other kilograms are based upon that agreed upon standard. And in fact, there is a standard kilogram and it's made out of a platinum iridium alloy, which means it's, it's inert, it doesn't corrode. But just in case, it's stored inside a double bell jar. And inside those two bell jars is the argon atmosphere, which excludes, the argon is, well, argon in, in the Greek means lazy. So argon gas is lazy because it doesn't react. It's a noble gas. <clears throat> and uh, it's stored at constant temperature in some cave in France. And that's your standard for mass. Mass is the amount of something. No matter where you are in the universe, mass is a mass is a mass. One kilogram here is a kilogram on the moon. Is a kilogram on the sun, if you can stand it. Is a kilogram on Jupiter, it's a kilogram on an asteroid. It doesn't matter. It's a kilogram. Now, weight, of course, we're going to talk about that later. Weight is something else. Weight does change. But the mass of the substance, my mass, is the same no matter where I am. It's a measure of how much substance. Okay, so that's a, a physical quantity that is a fundamental unit, a kilogram. Length. A standard, agreed upon standard, is the meter. 
Now this is international units, SI units. And the reason it's, it's not international system and it's but it IS, uh, of course, nowadays you could have mistaken that for Islamic State. So it's probably good that it's fortunate that it's SI. SI is based on the French system international. That's the, the French uh, version of international system. So that's why it's SIU, it's not IS. Okay, and the agreed upon length is the meter. The meter originally was uh, standardized as a fraction of the distance from the equator to the North Pole. Uh, and they just chopped it down into a small enough piece so it'd be about that long, a manageable size. And it was agreed upon the length, then a platinum meridian bar was constructed to represent the meter, and all other meters are based on that meter. Um, since that was done, and the original is still there, but since that was done, we developed uh, another method for standardizing the meter that could be taken anywhere. And it's based upon, uh, and this happened since lasers were invented, a certain color of laser light, and you hear your instrument is fast enough electronic to count how many wavelengths. And it counts the wavelengths, <clears throat> so many wavelengths, and says, okay, there you have it. That's a meter. And that instrument will give you the standard meter. It's probably more reliable than the original. Uh, standard time, we sort of inherited that one from posterity, from pre-modern science. Um, we just needed to standardize it. Okay, so now we do that with an atomic clock. Well, there's several atomic clocks scattered around the world. I think there's one in, in uh, Colorado. And they're extremely accurate. Uh, they give us the value for that one second. It's, it's actually, it's essential to our modern society now that we know what a second is uh, because of our um, dependence upon satellites. They need to know exactly the timing. What time is it? Um, and uh, for instance, our GPS system. There are 24 satellites in orbit around the Earth. And the way we tell where we are in reference to those, each one emits a signal of a different frequency. And your, in your cell phone now picks up those values, those signals, and they carry within them a time uh, signal of some kind. And that way you know exactly where you should be on a sphere. Right? From one satellite, it tells you, I gotta be on this sphere. So the other satellite tells you, you gotta be on this sphere somewhere. So you could be here, or you could be there. But you have a third satellite, at least three, and it gives you a, a signal that says, you're supposed to be here. So there you are, you know that's where you are. And the more satellites, four, five, six, seven, how many signals you can get, the more accurate, the closer you can get to your true location. And those were all based upon, um, knowing where the satellite is and the timing of its signal. That's, you need to know this accurately to microseconds. Uh, temperature is another standard uh, fundamental unit. It's standardized to the Kelvin. Now, everybody's familiar with Fahrenheit. Right? We, we know what uh, freezing feels like. <clears throat> In the sciences, we use Celsius more often. When we make direct measurements of a process, we measure it in uh, centigrade. I think it's centigrade. Maybe it's no. I keep changing. Celsius and centigrade are synonymous. And it will be degrees C. So many degrees C, right? Zero degrees C is freezing, right? 100 degrees C is boiling for water. Freezing water, boiling water. Body temperature. Right? We know that it's supposed to be 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. That's a different system. In the, in the uh, centigrade system, it's 37. Right? 
It's the same amount, it's the same temperature, but it's measured in two different systems. So these are actually equal to one another in terms of their physical expression. Okay, it's just a different system. <clears throat> so the standard for Celsius is the Kelvin. Now, don't panic. The size of the degree, one Kelvin degree, is exactly equal to one degree centigrade. So it's as if we're standardizing it to centigrade anyway. But Kelvin is, we're going to find out later that Kelvin is more useful for calculations. So just keep that in the back of your mind. It's the same size degree, right? One degree centigrade is one degree Kelvin. They're just different systems. Uh, we're not going to mess with this one in this class. The ampere is a measurement of electrical current. In other words, um, how many coulombs of charge pass a point in one second? That's one amp. Right? And we have sort of a feel for amps um, because we use electricity every day. And uh, what do they say um, for the guy in the electric chair? It's not the voltage that kills you, it's the amperage. It's the amount of current flowing through your body that kills you. Um, amount of substance. We will be using this one. And this is the mole. The mole, I think, is derived from molecule. But that unit of measure, and we'll establish it later, is a fundamental unit. Now, there are whole lots of other units that we use that are actually more convenient in certain circumstances, depending on whether you're measuring something very large or something very small. Okay. Um, there are units like light years that astronomers use or parsecs that they use. Um, but if you're into microscopy and, and little things like bacteria and viruses, you may use, um, well, not millimeters, it's even smaller than that, micrometers. So what's the difference in those derived units? No change. They're derived units. They're derived from these fundamental units. Right? So if we want to go from, uh, from Beckley to Charleston, we know that it's, um, well, it's for our unit's sake, let's say it's 60 miles. That's just, depends on where you go in Charleston. Let's just say it's 60 months. Um, that would be, let's see, I can't do that in my head right now. I'm going to convert it to uh, a metric unit. Okay. That would be about 96 kilometers. Okay. So, what does that mean in terms of length? Well, the meters we know. What does the kilo mean? We have prefixes for these units that derives the new unit. This new unit is actually, that stands for times 1,000. Kilo means 1,000. So a kilometer is actually 1,000 meters. So 96,000 meters to Charleston. But it's easier to say 96 kilometers. Okay? You can do that with any of these units. You just need to know what the prefixes mean. And I'm going to, uh, we've got a slide that'll show you the prefixes here in a second. Let's see. Yeah, prefixes. Here we go. Oh, by the way, the fundamental unit of mass is what? A kilogram. So the fundamental unit has within it a prefix, which is 1,000 grams, okay? Why did they pick kilogram and not grams as the fundamental unit? That's for practical reasons, okay? How much is a gram? Well, a gram in physical would be what? Not even that big. So what if you got a scratch on it? That would affect the on the standard 
if you got a scratch on your kit on your gram, that would affect its fundamental value by several percent. Right? It would be an unrecoverable damage. But if you use a thousand grams, then you get something like this big, and it, it can stand up to uh, as such as more useful to be that big. The reason we had to do that is because Graham was inherited from pre-modern science. So we're sort of stuck with it. So I said, okay, if you insist, then we're just gonna say, all right, our standard is gonna be the kilogram. But the prefix is still there. And these are your prefixes that you need to know. Uh, mega is a million, and that's a capital M. Little m is a million goes the opposite direction. Mega is a million times, a big M. So a megagram would be a million grams. And a little m before your G would be a milligram. It'd be a lot smaller. It'd be a thousandth of a gram rather than a million times a gram. Okay, That's, those prefixes are extremely important. Now, how do we go back and forwards between well, I'll show you that in a minute. Okay. It has to do with unit conversions. Okay. So you need to know what these mean, right? Mega means a million. K, little k, means a thousand. D means a tenth. Little d means a tenth, a deci. Centi, right? We know centimeters is a um, hundredth of a meter. So if the meter is this long, then a centimeter is going to be about that big. Um, the millimeter, the micrometer, we use this uh, Greek symbol, the mu, before the meter to mean micrometer. So it's a millionth of a meter. And the nano is a billion of a meter. Right? We sort of have an intuition about nano, right? nanotechnology. That means that whatever you're, the technology you're engineering is on a scale of a billionth of a meter. So nanofibers are going to be, you can't see them. Right? They're just like dust, or they build them into your clothes. Um, I think uh, the uh, exercise clothing industry is is heavy into nano fibers. Or, let's see, I don't have one with me. I've got this uh, blue cloth that I use to clean my whiteboard sometimes, and it's got nano fibers in it. And it feels, you rub your finger across, it's sticky because those little fibers get down into your uh, fingerprints and prickle at them. They're so small, the fibers are so small. That's what makes them good for cleaning whiteboards. Okay. Um, <clears throat> examples. Now I've already given you examples. A nanometer, right? And when you have a number that has one of these units of measure, um, you can do conversions fairly easily. If you say, um, I measure something that is 300 and 74 micrometers. If I want to know that what that is in meters, I just take this right here and say, that is 10 to the minus six. So it's 374 times 10 to the minus six meters. Okay? And then if you want to make a scientific notation, you just do your magic. One, two, right? So 3.74 times 10 to the minus four, because you had a plus two here and a minus six, add them together and get minus four. So that, that was a teaser for unit conversion. We'll get into it in a second. Okay. Um, volume. Volume is a derived unit based upon length. Right? So if you know um, how wide it is, how deep it is, and how tall it is, that volume, you can express that in terms of uh, a fundamental unit. So if it's a meter, okay, 
if it's one meter on this side, it's one meter on this side, and it's one meter deep, then you know how to calculate body. One times one times one is one. But when you do calculations in the sciences, don't forget the units. If I say one meter times one meter times one meter, I'm multiplying the units, one, but I'm also multiplying um, uh, the numbers, but I'm also multiplying the units. So a meter times a meter times a meter is a meter cubed, okay? You always have to consider the units when you're doing a calculation like that. So this blue cube is one cubic meter. And if we take a small part of it here, notice that this side is one meter, but it's subdivided into 10 units. So a 10th of a meter is a decimeter, okay? a decimeter right? with our prefix. But go back a decimeter, one tenth of a meter. So if we say this unit is uh, this little cube here is a decimeter on either on, on its sides, then one cubic decimeter is a new unit that we designate as the liter. Right? And we know we have an intuition about liters because everybody buys pot or they buy water in the bottles. Right? And you can get the, the two liter bottles, which are way overpriced, mm. or you can get the three liter bottles, which are a little more reasonable. Um, and we have a, a feel for what a liter is. Um, but that's its derived unit. Now, if we, if we take this deci uh, meter and we take that cube, and we go on its side and subdivide it into tenths, then a tenth of a decimeter is a centimeter because a centimeter is a hundredth of a meter, which is a tenth of a decimeter. Okay, let's see if we have let's say we have a meter. And let's see. Not quite a meter, but it's close enough. So if this is one meter, and we take a tenth of that, let's see, that's a half, maybe a tenth like that. This is decimeter. Okay. And if we take a tenth of that, it'll be like this. That is a centimeter. So a centimeter is a tenth of a decimeter, and a decimeter is a tenth of a meter. So a centimeter is a hundredth of a meter. Right? Because you took a tenth of a tenth, a tenth of a tenth is a hundredth. So the centimeter, the centi, equals 10 to the minus 2. So it's a hundredth of a meter. Okay? And this centimeter. If we have that little cube there, that little cube is a milliliter. If this is a liter, then how many milliliters are in a liter? Count up all the squares, right? You want to sit here forever and count squares? Well, it's actually a thousand milliliters. A thousand little squares in here make up that liter. So um, a milliliter. Milli B is 10 to the minus third. So a milliliter is 10 to the minus third liters. Right? I just took that milli and put it here. 10 to the minus third liters is a milliliter. So I'll go the other way around. How do you get back there? Right. How many of these does it take to make a liter? Well, I'd have to multiply that times 10 to the third. Because positive three and minus three is one. So then we get liter. It's a liter. So a thousand milliliters is a liter. Okay. All right, that's volume. 
uh, uh, here's an interesting point also. And based upon this diagram, we know that a cubic centimeter is a milliliter right here. Used to be in the medical profession, uh, everything was marked in cc's, um, cubic centimeter. And the reason they did cc's rather than cm to the third is because it's too expensive to print it that way. Uh, the printers couldn't do superscripts very easily. So instead they just called it cc, cubic centimeter. Nowadays, uh, you'll find everything marked off in milliliters. But physically, they're exactly the same size unit. A milliliter and a cubic centimeter are exactly the same size. Okay, um, mass. That's a measure of the amount of something. That's why it doesn't change no matter where you are in the universe. SI units to kilogram. And we have uh, an equivalence. Okay, this is our, we've had examples of equivalences before, but our equivalence here is one kilogram is equal to 2.2046 pounds on the surface of the earth. Now that's where it gets tricky because this is mass, this is weight. Okay. The difference is weight is a force. Kilogram is a mass. So this has to be on the surface of the earth. One kilogram on the surface of the moon would be about seven tenths of a pound. It would be one sixth. So that's just a word of caution. We're equating two things that are measurements of two different things. But mathematically speaking, it doesn't matter. When you use this equivalence for the purpose of conversion, converting units from one system to another, then it's, it's valid. It's mathematically valid, I should say. Uh, or you can go backwards. One pound is 454 grams, rounded off. And we'll talk about rounding in a minute also. Um, so how did we get that? Uh, let me not jump into it yet. I think I want to save that till we get to the conversions. But I'll show you how that's arrived at in a few minutes. And we measure these things using uh, a balance. This happens to be um, a microanalytical balance. In other words, it gives you lots of decimal places in the readout. <clears throat> in this case, it's got four decimal places. Well, that's not microanalytical, that's analytical. Four decimal places. Okay, very sensitive. Um, we won't spend time on right now on, on how balances work. Go back to the history because we just don't have time. Um, improper use of the commonly used units. Which ones do not make sense of these selections? Okay. A gallon of milk is equal to about four liters of milk. Okay, let's see. We know what a gallon is. Uh, we know what a liter is. Our intuition says a liter is about like that, about like this. Right, those little liter bottles. Okay, if you put four of those together, yeah, that's pretty close to a gallon. And if you're a label reader like I am, go through the grocery stores and spend half your time reading labor, you'll notice that milk now is marked off in both gallon and liters. If you look on the side of a, a gallon jug, it says 3.8 liters. So one gallon is exactly 3.8 liters, not about four. A 200 pound man has a mass of 90 kilograms. Well, what did we say? A kilogram is 2.2 pounds. So two times that is about 180 plus a little extra. Yeah, that's reasonable. See, I'm using estimation. You don't have to get the number exactly right. We're just trying to make sense. This makes sense. 
based upon estimation. A basketball player has a height of seven meters. Okay, a meter is what? About that? Seven times that? I think, I don't know any basketball players that are that tall. So that one's wrong. How about a nickel? It's 6.5 centimeters thick. So a centimeter is what? It's about like, that distance between those two marks, something like that. Six and a half of those. So is your nickel that thick? I don't think so. <laughs> okay. So intuition and estimation tell us that these last two are unreasonable. I had a friend of mine. Um, I lived in Baton Rouge, Louisiana for 13 years. Most of that time going to school. And my neighbor was a, uh, a student in mechanical engineering. And he told me stories. It amazed him that so many of the students in his classes would work out problems based upon what they knew in the chapter they were studying. And they'd slap the, the value down because it was filling the blank. They slap the answer down and it was wrong. And they never thought to check to see, does this make physical sense, right? I've got a bow. He, he was working with compound bows as a special project. So I loaned him a piece of equipment to do it measurements. And uh, you say, well, maybe it takes 150 pound draw until it lets off and then it's like 25 pounds. Okay. These students would do a calculation that would determine that it takes, um, uh, Three million pounds of force to pull that rope back. Doesn't make any sense. But they didn't think to estimate and ask themselves, is that sensible? Did I make a mistake in my calculations? You know, and go back and no, they just slapped it down, and got the wrong answer. So estimation can keep you honest. Okay. The topic of uncertainty. Let's see, where's my? I'll keep my hard copy open too, so I can. No, that's the next one. Tells me how far I'm going. Okay, I got an hour left. I think we can make it. Yeah, I can do that. Uh, let's see. Uncertainty. Uncertainty. There it is. Okay. Uncertainty. It's a fact of life. It's a fact of sciences. Every measurement is uncertain. You don't know if the measurement you make is exactly the true value. Um, it's like I'll say this over and over again. Nature just does what it does. They could care less if we're around. Nature just happens. It is. And we do things to try to understand it. So we don't, we're not supposed to fit nature to satisfy our preconceived notions. We're supposed to develop our notions, our, our laws and theories, as we discussed in chapter one, to fit nature. Right. Oh, that's if you're, if you're not a politician and you're not a lawyer, then you're supposed to do it that way. If you're a politician and a lawyer, then you try to pit, you try to shoehorn uh, evidence into, into your um, if you're a lawyer, your client's best interest, right? Even if you're lying through your teeth. But in sciences, we recognize that every measurement is uncertain. What we want to do is get a handle on how much uncertainty uh, can we expect from this measurement? And how do we deal with that uncertainty when we do calculations? Right? Because we want to keep our values honest. Uh, science is a peer-reviewed endeavor. In other words, you've always got other scientists looking over your shoulder, right? And they have every right to take your published work and try to reproduce it. If they can't reproduce it, then you've got to explain why they didn't, or they've got to explain why you're full of bunk, right? And they'll do it, right? It's a career advancement. If you can discredit somebody like Einstein, some, some I mean, that's a... Uh, Check mark by your name. And it's been attempted, 
and the best scientists survive those assaults. And that's how science advances. It's always in a state of flux. Okay, uncertainty. Um, whenever a scientist sees one of your measurements, they see a number, let's say um, four, seven, six, one, two. And we'll say that's, um, I don't know, meters. When they look at that number, they know instantly by convention that these numbers here are certain. They're chiseled in stone. There's no variability possible with these numbers. That they are it. This one is uncertain. Another word for that is, it's a guess. So you're guessing the last digit of your number. Okay. That's the way they see it. So whenever you, when you make a measurement, you want to keep as many digits as you can honestly keep. Don't throw anything away until you have to. Okay. Oh, uh, we're okay. We're going to be kind. It's an estimated number. It's not a guess, it's estimated. <clears throat> so if we're measuring the length of this nail, and we look at um, look at here. We say, okay, this is in centimeters. So it's one centimeter, two centimeters, not quite three. So it's between two and three. Okay. So it's between two and three, somewhere in there. Uh, okay. So do we have any other markings there that we can use to give us exact values? Okay. Yeah, as a matter of fact, we do. Okay. If we look at um, this blown up version, we know that between two and three is subdivided into 10 parts. So a tenth of a centimeter is a millimeter or a, a point. We could put two points on it. We want to put a number there. Okay. So we look at it really close and it looks like we're 2.5667. Eight. Okay, so we have a mark on there that says 0.8 centimeters, but it's not quite 0.9, it's between 0.8 and 0.9. So we look really close, right? And that's misleading because there are no more marks in here, but it looks like it's halfway between the eight and nine. So we say, all right, I'm going to estimate halfway between. 0 0.8 to 0.9. This is my uncertain value. These are certain numbers. Those are certain digits, uncertain digits. And this will be in centimeters. Okay. I don't know why I keep that slide over there because it's misleading. This says that there is a mark on there for 0.5, which means that would be exact. And, and then we would have to add a zero, because it looks like it's right on the five. So I would add a zero there. And the zero would be uncertain, and the five would be certain. <coughs> <coughs> okay. Any uncertain digits? There we go. Animations. All right. So uh, now, in addition to uh, that convention of certain and uncertain digits, um, if you make a measurement, you want to know, can you make a measurement again and get the same number or very close to it? Right? That's called precision. If you can make several measurements and they're very close to each other, that's a precise uh, group of measurements. And if you average them, then you know that your value is, is uh, representative of all the measurements that you make, very close to it. That's precision. It has to do with distribution of a grouping. And let's see, do I have it here? Yeah, here we go. I've got these uh, uh, 
targets. I'm going to put them all up at once. Okay. Accuracy is how close are you to the bullseye? Right. You expect the value for this substance, uh, something. Say, okay, let's use, say you have a, what you think is a kilogram weight. And I should say mass, a kilogram mass. And you want to know um, how close is it to the original? To the fundamental, the standard. Right? So you send it off to France and they compare it to their standard. And they tell you, okay, your kilogram is actually 0.9954. So your kilogram is pretty close. I'd say it's it's accurate. Right, because it's, it's there's not much discrepancy in, in the value. But if you sent that same one, it had a big scratch in it. And it happened to be 0.99503. I say that's inaccurate. Okay, so how close it is to the accepted value. Sometimes we say true value, but true values are awfully difficult to establish. So accepted value is probably a better term. So uh, how close it is, and this, this can be determined for one measurement, this accurate, or it can be determined for a group of measurements. How close is it to the bullseye, to the accepted value? And precision is, what's the distribution? Is it compact or is it just everywhere, all over the place? So accurate, accuracy and precision are based upon those concepts. All right, so if we look at this uh, target, um, and I don't know if any of you are, are hunters or if you like target practice, um, if you have a, a, a hunting rifle, and before you go out at the beginning of the season, you what's called zero your scope. In other words, you set your target up at whatever distance you think you're gonna be shooting, 100 yards, 150 yards, 200 yards. And then you, you take, usually take three shots at it. And you say, where are those, where do they occur on the, uh, on the target? Well, if they occur off to one side, but they're real tight grouping, that's good. It's, it's, your, your rifle is, the ballistics are precise if they have a tight grouping, but they're not on the bullseye. So you adjust your scope, and then you take three more shots and hopefully eventually you get down to where your grouping is right on the bullseye. Now you know you're going to hit what you aim at. Okay, in that case, uh, once you've adjusted your scope, you should have both accuracy and precision. All of your shots are close to the bullseye and they're really tightly grouped. That's where you have good accuracy, good precision. Okay. Uh, in the case where you have um, uh, a reasonably tight grouping, this is not the best, but it's tight enough, that would be precise but not accurate because the average of that puts it right in here somewhere, not on the bullseye. So that would be precise but not accurate. Um, this one would be uh, accurate but not precise. Why can we say it's accurate when it's over here, nowhere near the bullseye? We can take an average. The average of these puts it right on the bullseye. So it's accurate, but not precise because the grouping is spread out. And then you have the example where you're, you're not accurate and you're not precise, right? You got these scattered all over the place. Uh, average those together, you're out here somewhere and it's a mess. This is one we really try to avoid. Uh, sometimes in, in agriculture, which is my background, um, when, you, when you're uh, running an experiment out in the elements, uh, there's so many variables. Um, it's very hard to get repeatable results. So you have to conduct your experiment over several years, which I did. My, my PhD work was over five years of field research. Um, 
And what you hope for is even if it, your values are not precise, you can average them out and they'll, they'll give you an accurate answer. So this is like, this is agriculture. <clears throat> okay. Now, um, what do we mean by significant figures? Now we're headed toward the place where we're going to use our understanding of uncertainty to help us calculate values, put two or more values together in a calculation and uh, determine how to express the answer honestly in terms of its accuracy and precision. So we need to count significant figures first. In other words, we have to know which of those digits are significant, which ones can we hold on to as we go through the calculation. Okay. And when we're counting significant figures, these are the rules. All non-zero integers are significant. So from one to nine, in any number that you have, say, let's make up another one. All of those are significant because they're not zero. Okay, we count all four of them. Now, uh, here's four significant figures for that. Then you have zeros. You have non-zero numbers and you have zero numbers. Zeros depends on where they're located in the number. Okay. So the first class is if you have any leading zeros. So we're going to work from left to right. So if you have leading zeros, let's say we have 0.0. .0. Four, five, nine, three. Those zeros are not significant. You can't count. Them. So we have four significant figures in that number. Okay. Example here, two significant figures there. Captive zeros. Those zeros that are in a number and they're surrounded by non-zero numbers. For instance, if we change this one to, if we put a zero right here, that zero is significant. It has to be significant because if we don't count it, then we lose that place, right? Tenths, hundreds, thousands, ten thousandths. We lose the thousandths place. And we put three where it shouldn't be. So this one is significant. One, two, three, four significant figures in that number. Okay. What if we have two zeros together like that? Bracket. Now we have one, two, three, four, five significant figures. So there Good. just can't be a one basically like off to the side where they could be right. significant. These are not significant. These two are significant. Now the other class is zeros to the right of non-zero numbers. Right. If we had a zero out here, like that. Okay. There you go. Trailing zeros, it depends. Trailing zeros, if there's a decimal, an explicit decimal in the number, the trailing zeros are significant. So here's our explicit zero uh, decimal. These are not significant. Those two are, that one is also. It's a placeholder. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six significant figures in that number. Um, let's see if I have some examples. Yeah, there we go. Two trailing zeros, they're all significant because there's an explicit decimal. This one does not have an explicit decimal, 150. So that means that zero is not significant. Okay, how do we make it significant? Suppose we, we intended that that zero should be significant when we made our measure. Put a decimal there. Now it's significant. It's understood. Understood decimals uh, make that not significant. Explicit decimal makes it significant. Okay. 
That might not seem like much right now, but it will be once you start calculating. Okay, those are the rules for significant figures. Oh, I left one out. Exact numbers. Exact numbers um, have infinite significant figures. And the reason we say infinite is uh, for the purposes of calculation, you don't have to limit your answer based upon that number. Okay, counting numbers are like that, like nine pencils. Right? How are you going to put, uh, say, a fractional pencil with it? You're not. It's either one pencil or none. So uh, counting numbers are exact. And then conversion factors are infinitely significant. So the example I like to use is one inch is equal to 2.54 centimeters. If I use that value in a calculation, it has infinite significant figures because it's part of the conversion factor. And I'll show you what a conversion factor looks like in just a minute. Just keep that one in the back of your head. Conversion factors are always infinite. Significant figures. Okay. Um, so how do we treat significant figures when we're trying to uh, convert a standard notation into the scientific now, they say exponential notation, but what they really mean is scientific. <clears throat> so when we say 300 is converted into <clears throat> uh, scientific notation, 3.00 times 10 to the square. And we know that if we look at that number, those two zeros are significant because there's an explicit decimal there, right? But if we leave that decimal off, we know that this number only has one significant figure. So when you convert that to scientific notation, that's all you can keep. You can't keep those zeros because they're not significant, okay? Uh, let's see. The advantage of scientific notation is if you do it right, all you have to look at is the coefficient and you know instantly how many significant figures are in that number. You can ignore that for the purposes of significant figures. Um, let's see. Okay, we're going to have to know how to round numbers. And this is a prelude to calculations using significant figures and calculations. Because when you get your answer, you may only be allowed by the rules to keep so many significant figures. So you need to know how to round off your number to that number of significant figures. So the rule we're gonna use is uh, five or less, you round down five, uh, less than five, you round down five and more, you round up. It's just simpler that way. There are a number of schemes for rounding, but this is good enough for our work. Um, okay, so that one would be rounded. If we can only keep two significant figures there, we'd have to round it to these two right here. And when you round, let's say 5.64 uh, six, four, six, seven, nine. Let's say we have to round that one to the two significant figures. What do you do? Well, you don't round this one up to eight and then this one up to seven and then this one up to five and this one up to seven. You don't step through it. You determine how many of these can I keep? I, I can keep two significant figures. All right, now you look to the right of that number. That one's less than five. You can only keep that. If you do it this other way, which is wrong, you end up with significant calculation error. 
And if you have a series of calculations and you do it for every step, you could be, the answer should be down here and you're saying the answer is way up here. Rounding error, they call it. Okay. Um, right, in this case, we round that one to seven because this is greater than five. Okay. Um, this, this statement refers to um, significant figures in calculations. So just hold this one in reserve. Um, there are basically two rules for calculations and significant figures in the answers. One is for multiply, divide, and exponent. And the other is add, subtract. If you have multiply divide only through all of your calculations, then you avoid rounding error if you do your calculations all the way to the end and hang on to all the decimal places that you can. Your calculator will give you just oodles of decimals. Then at the end, you look back at your calculation and say, um, use the rules, and then you round your final answer. That avoids rounding error for calculations involving only multiply, divide, and exponents. When you insert, add, and subtract, then that's, that's another can of worms and I'll, we'll go through it in a minute. Okay, here are operations. You got multiply, divide. Okay. Multiply, divide is the simpler one. All you have to do in the calculation, say this is only one step, you got this one times that. And your calculator says 7.381, right? But you know, based upon this, you can only keep two significant figures because that is the least number of significant figures in the operators. You can't keep four, you keep the least number, okay? So we take this one and we have to round this one to two significant figures. So this one rounds to 7.4. That obeys multiply, divide, Yeah, I got my lines a little off. They should be shifted over a little bit. Okay, add, subtract. Add, subtract, the limiting um, rule is on the number of decimal places. So you take your numbers and you line them up like you're going to add them long in, right? And you line up your decimals. Then you add everything together. In this case, add works for subtract also. Add them together right here. Now, in your answer, you can keep as many decimal places as in the smallest number of decimal places for your operator. This one has two decimal places. So you can keep two in your answer, which means you have to round seven up to eight. Okay, that's the add subtract rule. So like I was saying before, if it's all multiply divide, you can just work it all the way to the end and then look back at your least number of significant figures and round your answer. But if you've got to add subtract, then that kind of comes up and works. And you have to, you have to use this rule in conjunction with the other. We'll do some examples. And besides, I've given you this thing, it's called review document right here. It looks exactly like a paper exam that I would give in class, uh, but, but with a lot more problems, right? The exam will be smaller than this. This gives you lots of practice. Question, say, do you know about how many questions you're going to get on our first exam? Um, let me see. Let's see. But they may take, I mean, if you work out these problems right here and you're comfortable doing all of them, then the exam should be a piece of cake. You should be able to sit down and do one like in five, 10 seconds. 
or you can do some in five or 10 seconds. Some of them might take a minute, but um, you'll knock them out pretty quick. Oh, and uh, another thing, in this review document, on the last pages, there's what's called uh, useful information right here for my viewing audience, useful information. Anything in useful information you see in this document, and this document is in the module one for exam one, right? there's also a key that gives you the answers you can check yourself. A lot of my students do that. They take, sit down with this and work it just like an exam, and then go back to the key and check it out, and then they find out where their weeks, weaknesses are and go back and work on those. Um, but what I was saying was that useful information is there on every review document that I distribute for each exam. And that useful information, um, if you come sit down, it will be on the last pages of the exam, all that information. Uh, if you take an online exam, then in the module for the exam, you'll have separate files, one for useful information. Uh, later on, there might be a periodic table. So if you're gonna take the exam online, you want to print out those documents first because once you go into Respondus Monitor Lockdown Browser, it won't let you look at anything but the exam. Right? So you wanna have those documents handy. It's kosher, you can use those during the, the exam. You can't use your textbook, you can't uh, surf the internet because Lockdown Browser won't let you. You can't use another computer to do it because the eye is watching you, you're being videoed. Um, but, that useful information is there so that you don't have to memorize everything and it relieves some anxiety. Of course, if you work enough of these problems using the useful information, then a lot of that stuff you'll memorize just by using it. Okay, back to the topics here. Uh, multiply, divide, add, subtract. There, there. Okay. Now, when you're actually making measurements in the laboratory and you make multiple measurements um, in, in sequence, then the final answer that you are allowed to report depends upon the um, accuracy of your measuring devices. So if you use one device that's this accurate and the next device is less accurate, then this one sort of, uh, for lack of a better term, it dumbs down your answer, right? So in this case, we're gonna combine these two volumes. And in this one, we say, okay, that volume is one, two, not quite three millimeters. It looks like it's, and these are two tenths marks. Look, see there are five of them between two and three. So each one is two tenths. So we have, uh, 2.2, 0.4, 0.6, 0.8, and 2.8, and then we estimate. 2.82, it looks like. Okay, we're going to add those together. And this one, we've got 0 0.2, 0 0.2, 0.28, 2468. It looks like it's right on 2.80. Let's see. Actually, I think the idea is here. I can't use that one. Okay, so our, for argument's sake, um, 0.28. Okay, let's do that. Let's say this, this is both, it's, um, we can argue about it, but let's say it's right on the line. And this one is right on that line. Actually, what we should do is like this, that, that. And when we add them together, right, 3.08, we can only keep like that. So this would be 3.08 millimeters. But for this example, they chopped off that one and that one. So we're actually limited to 3.1. I shouldn't have changed this slide before. 
The point of this slide is you're limited by the accuracy of the least accurate device. I could tell you another story, but it's, we're already got only about a half hour left, so I better stop. Okay. What do we mean by dimensional analysis? Dimensional analysis is a fancy word for keep track of your units. If you keep track of your units, a lot of the problems in chemistry can be solved uh, as long as you don't violate any physical laws, can be solved with mathematics alone. So what do we mean by dimensional analysis? Well, one way is we're converting one unit to another. Remember when I mentioned temperature, body temperature is 37 degrees centigrade or 98.6 Fahrenheit. It's the same heat content, but different measurements. So let's say we have one measurement, we want to convert to the other. We need a way to convert from one unit to another. And in order to do that, you need an equivalence statement. In other words, we had one before, one inch equals 2.54 centimeters, okay? So whenever you have an equivalence, you instantly have a conversion factor. You know what this one is equal to, that one is equal to. So let's say we have um, 10, centimeters and we want to convert it to inches okay all right what we need is a way to get rid of the centimeters and leave us with inches that's what we want to do we want to cancel the centimeters out so in mathematical terms the conversion factor needs to have centimeters down here Right. This is in the numerator, always. Right, The number standing alone like that is always a numerator. That's the numerator, this is the denominator. Now, remember, all calculations have to take into account units of measure. So if this one's in the numerator and that's in the denominator, they cancel. So we need inches up here. Okay. Now, how do we get that from here? Well, let's say... We divide both sides, and we're not violating any mathematical rules, both sides of this equation by 2.54 centimeters. Okay, that's kosher. If you divide the whole equation through by the same number, both sides, you haven't changed the equivalence at all. Okay. All right, so what is this one equal to? One. That number is equal to one. Okay. That's why this number, any number multiplied by one is valid. Right? But that doesn't get us where we want to go. We still got 10 centimeters. So we're going to substitute what's equal to one right here. This is equal to one. Now we get rid of centimeters. And that takes care of the dimensions, the analysis of the dimensions, dimensional analysis. Now we just have to crunch numbers. So 10 divided by 2.54 is what? My calculator. So 10 divided by 2.54 is 3.937 inches. Okay, how many of those that can we keep? Well, I mentioned earlier, conversion factors are infinite. Right? So this one doesn't affect the answer at all. That one does, it's only got two significant figures. So I can keep these two, that one's a three, There you go. That's the answer. 10 centimeters is 3.9 inches. With that explicit decimal in there, I have two significant figures here. So I can have two there. Okay. 
Now, most conversions are going to be uh, multiply divide or powers, exponents. Some conversions have add subtraction, but most of them are going to be like this. Okay, um, let's see. This is a conversion factor. Notice if we wanted to go the other direction, say we had inches here and we wanted to go to centimeters. Instead of that, you would divide by one inch. Divide this by one inch, one inch over here. 2.5 centimeters divided by one inch is equal to one. And that becomes your conversion factor. Notice that if this is a conversion factor equal to one, you can flip it. Just put the denominator in the numerator, the numerator, the denominator, you still got one, right? The inverse of one is one. So whichever way you need the conversion factor, you can flip it. It just depends on which one you need to cancel, and which one you need to keep. Now, um, I think some of my students learned conversions uh, by the uh, picket fence method. So they had, they had uh, 10 centimeters here, and then they needed something over here of centimeters, inches, and then if they could go on and on. And that's fine, that works. I like parentheses, but if you're used to using the picket fence, that's fine, it works. Okay. Um, and then does your answer make sense? Estimation or intuitive? Does our answer make sense? Yeah. Notice that when we say one inch equals 2.54 centimeters, if the number is bigger, then the unit of measure has to be smaller. So if this is one and that's two, that's bigger, then this one has to be a smaller size unit than that one in order for them to be equal. That's got to be smaller to give you this one. And that works all the time. Get a conversion factor. If the number gets bigger, the units get smaller. If the number gets smaller, the unit gets bigger. Right. All right. Let's see. Where do I stand with the hard copy? Um. I want to be sure I get to all this stuff. So, um, how many inches does this represent? Like, what kind of conversion factor do we need? We need to go from feet to inches. So, we need this equivalence one foot equals 12 inches. And then we need to, to arrange it in such a way that it cancels the feet and leaves us with inches. Here we go. Uh, in this case, we have four and a half pounds. How many grams is that? In this case, we're going to do a chain conversion. When you multiply and divide, you can have multiple conversion factors to get where you're going. All right. So if we're going from four and a half pounds, We want to end up with grams. Well, maybe you do know a single conversion that will go from pounds to grams. Yeah, actually, I do. But suppose we don't know that. Well, if we're going from what do we do know? Well, we're going from one system to another. It might be convenient to go from this system to the metric system and then take the metric where we want to go. So using what we're given. We're getting rid of pounds and leaves us with kilograms. So we've got uh, 2.2046 pounds and one kilogram. Okay, that cancels pounds, but now we've got kilograms. So we got to go to grams. Kilograms on the bottom, grams on the top. One kilogram is a thousand grams. So keeping track of your units leads you to the right answer. So now all we have to do is crunch numbers. 
That number divided by this number times that number gives us grams. There we go. And that's in scientific notation. So when you're working problems on the review document or in a test, um, most of my problems are uh, multiple choice. So look at the answers and see, all right, in this case, what units do, does he want? Does he want it in scientific notation or is it standard notation? Well, if it's standard notation, then you don't have to go that far. You just write down the number. If your calculator is set up to, to spit out answers in scientific notation, you may have to convert. And that's another thing with your calculators, um, you're going to have to learn how to work those on your own. Sometimes I can help you, um, but my calculator is nothing like most others. Mine's a reverse Polish notation, which is um, in the beginning is kind of counterintuitive, but after you learn how to use it, it's just powerful. In other words, algebraic calculators, you know, if you're going to do multiple calculations, very often you have to put parentheses in to make calculations. Uh, nowadays, they're, they're better with that. Um, you can do a calculation and hit the equal button, and it's, it's got a big screen, and it gives you multiple answers. So you can do one calculation, and then you plug in another one, and plug in another one. So they sort of worked their way around that. But with uh, RPM calculators, the way they're set up, I do a sequence of calculations uh, just as fast as you put the numbers in. Okay, um, here's an example I, I give my students. Suppose if you've ever taken a road trip, what do you want to know? First and foremost, you want to know that you got enough gas to get where you're going and gas to get back. Okay, so what does that mean? That means money. How much money do I need to take with me to buy gas down and back? Or how much credit do I need to have on my card to get there? <clears throat> so um, we're going to do a calculation that takes you from New York to Los Angeles. All right, so what do you need to know? This, is, this goes back to problem solving. When you see something like this, what's the question? All right. The question is, how much money is it going to cost to get there? Right. It's, not in, it's not implicit in the wording, but you know you've got to do that. You've got to find how much money it's going to cost. So what information do you need? Well, you need to know how far it is one way, and then double that for both ways, plus add a little buffer for driving around. Distance, you need to know the uh, efficiency of your car, miles per gallon, and you need to know how much gas is going to cost. Right? That's a big if. If you're going through lots of time zones, uh, it may vary. And when you get to California, it's going to cost probably twice what it is here. Now it is. It used to not be that way. We had a responsible government in charge. Okay, so the distance, 2,500 miles. Okay. Say your miles per gallon is 25. That's stretching it for me, but for some people, it's, it's good. Uh, cost per gallon, uh, it's, that's not bad right now, around here, 325. Uh, I just bought gas in Lewisburg and it was just a hair under $3. Uh, and going from miles traveled to money required is a conversion. Cancel miles to give you gallons of gas you need and they cancel gallons to give you money you need. So that's a chain to conversion. So you need $325 uh, dollars to get from New York to Los Angeles. And if you want to get back, double it, right? Seven, uh, 650. And then for driving around, maybe 700 or 750. Okay. So we're going to use temperature as an example for conversion here. And in this conversion, you've got both multiply, divide, 
and add subtract rules. But first, we want to know what, how did the systems develop? Right? And I've got a little bit of time for that. Let me see if I can do that. Yeah, we're going to do density too. So I'm going to go pretty quick. Um, Fahrenheit, Celsius, and Kelvin. Those are the three biggies. Fahrenheit would cause all of our weather information is in Fahrenheit. And our medical is in Fahrenheit mostly. Celsius is scientific. Actual measurements in Celsius are centigrade. And then when you do calculations, sometimes you have to convert Celsius to Kelvin. And it's like I said, temperature is just heat, it's heat. Temperature is temperature. The system that you use determines the answer you get. Right? Nature just does what it does, and our systems have to run to match it. Okay, so a Fahrenheit was developed by a German, I think. And his interest, and this is in uh, chronological order, his interest was in uh, biological systems. So he wanted uh, a system of measurement that would um, bracket in living systems. Right. So I had a physics teacher in high school who told me um, he got he um, had his thermometer built and he wanted to standardize where to zero. So he he made the coldest coldest thing he could um, ice and salt, and he called that zero. Right. So freeze ice cream. And then he said he wanted to know where 100 was. So his wife was mad at him about something. She was hopping mad. Red face was red. He stuck the thermometer in her mouth and that was 100. Instead of 98.6. Uh, that's a story. Um, but be that as it may, um, freezing point of water is 32 degrees Fahrenheit. Boiling point is 212. Right? And there are 180 units between those two. So you divide those evenly, and that's the size of your degree Fahrenheit. On the Celsius scale, Celsius was interested in chemical uh, reactions and their temperatures. So he stuck with freezing point of water and boiling point of water, which could be very easily reproduced in any lab to standardize your thermometers. So those were his, zero to 100, 100 degree units. So you can see, that the Celsius uh, travels 100 degree units in this gap, whereas Fahrenheit travels 180 units. So the Fahrenheit size degree is going to be smaller but it's because it takes more of it to get to the same location as Celsius does. And then Kelvin is simply the same size degree as Celsius, but the zero point is moved. The zero point now is absolute zero. Absolutely no heat, no molecular activity whatsoever. Now that's imaginary. We can't get there, right? but it's calculated. And then the rest of the system is uh, the beauty of the Kelvin system. We can focus on one thing is the sign. Kelvin has no negative sign. They're all positive. Whereas Celsius can have some negative degrees, Fahrenheit can have some negative degrees. When you start doing calculations in chemistry, those negatives can really get in the way. So when we do calculations in chemistry, most often we have to convert to Kelvin so that we have all positive numbers. Um, all right, I'll talk about, um, I think when we get to gases, I'll talk about how Kelvin arrived at his system. Um, that way we won't have to take up time now. But conversions, um, here's the way I learned it. Fahrenheit is equal to centigrade, actually nine fifths centigrade plus 32. Right? And if you know that one, you can solve for any one of these. Right? This one right here is the same as the one I just wrote. This nine fifths is 1.80. Okay. Um, if you have centigrade, you plug it in there, do the calculation, and get Fahrenheit. So for this one, you use add subtract rules. 
and then combined with that one, you get uh, no multiply divide and then add subtract. Well, that's a combination of rules for significant figures. Uh, and for Kelvin, Kelvin is equal to centigrade plus two seventy three. Actually, there are decimals out here, but for our purposes, 273 is good enough. If you want to know how these, uh, this formula was derived, just go to this website. It gives you a really good explanation. It should be printed out in your hard copy. Okay, so if we have 102 Fahrenheit, what is that in Kelvin? So think, do we have a direct conversion from Fahrenheit to Kelvin? No, you got to go to centigrade and then go to Kelvin. Now you could probably algebraically combine the two. Right? That's, that's doable. But we would take the, let's see, is it going to show us? Yeah, the Fahrenheit and uh, we want to go to Celsius. So we would solve our equation for C. So if we have this one, like this, 1.80 C plus 32, but we want to solve for that. Well, you have two possibilities. You can put in what you know, this one, and solve for that one, or you can solve for it. This is where algebra comes in. So I assume, this, has everybody had algebra? Okay. <laughs> we don't use a lot of it, but what we do use is very important. So. We subtract 32 from both sides. Okay. Is that kosher? Subtract 32 over here and now it's over here. Okay. Then we divide both sides by 1.8. Okay. And that's Celsius. Now you can plug in Fahrenheit and solve it for that equation, for that value. And that gives you centigrade. 39 degrees C. Now to go Kelvin, you add 273. And Kelvin is 312. Okay. If you want to go backwards, you just subtract 273 from this and then solve for Fahrenheit. Okay. You can go both ways. Oh, this is an interesting problem. Since Fahrenheit and centigrade are two different size degree marks, they don't have the same slope if you plot them. So somewhere they're going to intersect. So at some point, um, the units might be different, but the, the number will be exactly the same. So at what point on the scale is centigrade value equal to the Fahrenheit value? Well, all we have to do is Say, all right, if they're equal, then they're both equal to some variable x, x centigrade, x Fahrenheit are exactly equal. Right? So if that's the case, then this is the expression. We just put an x there and an x there. Now we've got an equation in one unknown. <clears throat> Anytime you have an algebraic expression with one unknown, you can solve for it. So we put an x in there. Right here, okay, there's x, there's x. Now we solve for x. So at what temperature are they both equal? X equals minus, minus 40. Minus 40 degrees Celsius is equal to minus 40 degrees Fahrenheit. And I know what minus 40 feels like. Because I used to work in a hotel and restaurant supplier. So we had, uh, we had a, a meat prep department where they cut some beef and, and other types and they had ground made hamburgers. And, and we had frozen products and we had dry goods and we had a blast freezer. So if we're gonna make hamburgers and we want them to preserve for a long time, uh, the best way is to freeze them really fast. And that way they, they maintain their freshness better when they're thawed out. So we had a blast freezer at minus 40 degrees Fahrenheit. And once a month, the beginning of the month, everybody came in early, like at 3.30, in the morning, and they fed us a breakfast, high calorie breakfast. And then, <laughs> low man on the totem pole, 
got to go in and inventory the blast freezer. And that was me. I was going to school at the time and I was a low man. So <clears throat> I got to wear the big quilted coat and the big hat with their muffs and gauntlets and go in there with my clipboard and start inventory. And I stay in there for 10 or 15 minutes and come out and warm up. And I go back in. <clears throat> it, I'm very cold. And, um, well, enough said about that. Now, the last topic I want to talk about is density. Density is by definition, and this is a formula. Many things that happen in chemistry and physics are formulas. Density by definition is the mass, that means mass, divided by its volume. Okay? Mass per unit volume is density. Now, um, intensive versus extensive values. Uh, sometimes I call this an intensity factor. And this is a capacity factor. When you see a, a value, you can look at it in these terms. An extensive or capacity factor, uh, a value for something, changes with how much substance there is, how much of it there is. Right? So mass, if there's more of the substance, it'll be more mass. Or um, if you um, squirt perfume into this room, eventually it'll expand to fill the room. And it'll have a new volume. Right? So the volume uh, expression is a capacity factor, an extensive property. But if you um, if you take my volume and my mass and do this calculation, you find out what my density is. My density doesn't change. Right? If you um, this would be a, a, a gruesome example, but and would be a wildly inaccurate. So let's use something else. Let's say you have a, a big bar of gold sitting on the table. Right? Uh, it has a certain mass. If you have a coin of gold, it has a different mass. That's an extensive property. But an intensive property for that gold would be its density. How much does it weigh per cubic centimeter? What's its mass per cubic centimeter? That's the same for whether you have a big bar or a small coin. That's an intensive property, and that's density. Most, not all, but most intensive properties are ratios. Right? They'll have these two units. So for this one, for solids, the units of measure will be grams per cubic centimeter volume. For liquids and gases, we say grams per milliliter. Notice that grams are the same, but the centimeters and milliliters are actually equal to. So this unit will have the same number. Right? Okay. And that is an intensive property. All right. So there's an expression of density. Now, um, how do you find the density of a regular object? If you have an object that is a regular shape, like a cube, The volume is going to be um, height and depth and length. That's easy. That's volume. But what if it's an irregular object? We usually measure the volume of irregular objects by displacement. So this woman is going to jump into that tank and notice the water is at this level first. And when she jumps in, 
as long as she's completely submerged, then the difference between where she was and where she is is per volume. Okay, that's volume by difference. Um, you can do that with um, any object that doesn't absorb a lot of water. Uh, like a rubber stopper we use in the lab that some of our exercises will do the density of a rubber stopper by difference. Get the mass on a balance and then the volume and do your calculation. Um, but there are some things that you can't do that with water, like um, sodium metal. You take a chunk of sodium metal and throw it in water, it doesn't just sit there, it reacts with the water. Violent reaction. So you would have to drop it into mineral oil and get the difference because it won't react with oil. Okay. Um, let's see. Um, the one problem here could be is if the woman floats with her head out of the water. Now you're not measuring the volume of the whole person, you're just measuring from her neck down. So you're not getting her whole volume. So how would she get her whole volume? Well, she'd probably either wear a weight belt or blow some air out and then sink. That's the only way you can get the volume. If the, if the object only floats partially in the water, then you're only measuring the density of what's floating, uh, of the volume that's in the water. Uh, okay. All right, I'm over. I'm going to have to leave this one till later. This calculates density of this object, grams, cubic centimeters, simple calculation. I will say that when you have a formula like this, if you know, these are variables. If you know two of these, you can solve for the third. You don't have to use it just for calculating density. If you know that one and that one, you can do that. But suppose you know the density and you know the volume and you don't want to know what the mass is. Plug in that one, that one, and solve for that. So if you know this value, then it would come over here D times V equals mass. Okay. Or if you know mass and density, then you can solve for volume. Volume comes over here, density goes over here, and now you can solve for volume. Okay. Uh, and that's what we're doing here. The unknown is mass. So we solve for that unknown. Let's see. If you have, if the volume is not in the correct units of measure, right? This is in liters and that's cubic centimeters. Now you're going to have to make the conversion here between liters and cubic centimeters before you can do the calculation. So always keep track of your units. That's part and parcel of dimensional analysis. Okay. So we end up with 125 cubic centimeters, then do the calculation of density 1.95. Now, if we put that object in water, is it going to float or sink? This is Archimedes' principle, so it's really not chemistry. Density of water is one gram per cubic centimeter. Anything that's denser than water will sink. Anything that's less dense than water will float. Right. So this is going to sink. Okay. Uh, let's see. This takes um, the formula and rearranges it to find out the volume. Right. So mass divided by density. Was alive. So this is how much water it displaced. But the question wasn't how much displaced, but what's the new level? Right? We started off at 50 milliliters. What's the new level? Well, it's going to be 50 plus the volume that you put in there. So it'd be 58.37 or 58.4. We had to round it off because we didn't want to keep freezing it. Oh, by the way, um, the one thing that we didn't show in the add subtract rules is 
What if you don't have an explicit decimal point? How do you line up your numbers? So if we have three, four, five, six, and we have a number here that's um, nine, two, zero. Well, we line up the understood decimals like that, okay? And if we add this together, six, seven, 13, four, okay? How many of those can we keep? Well, that's not significant. So we have to go like that and round it four, three, eight, zero. We gotta keep a zero in that place. Otherwise, it's 438 and not 4380. And that's why, how you deal with numbers that don't have an explicit decimal. You line up the implied decimal and then you limit to the significant figures like that. Okay? I think I've got uh, an example or two in the review document. There's also uh, in the learning management system, Brightspace, there should be practice. Um, online practice exams that you can do. You don't have to use uh, Respondus Monitor to take them. You just click on them and go in, and, and they're set up exactly like an online exam. If, if that's your chosen method, if you're going to show up, then your test will look like this hard copy. Um, but those are there for my online students and web based students to drill. You can drill those uh, practice tests and get comfortable with uh, using that method of taking the test. Okay, that's it. Chapter two. Tuesday, we'll do chapter three. And then Thursday, we'll do a review. And then the following Tuesday, we'll have an exam. Any questions, comments, complaints? Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, the real learning takes place when you Work problems and you, you exercise that muscle up here between your ears. So say, as long as you're available when I need you. <laughs> yes. And this, um, uh, there's my schedule. Right? There's a copy of it on, on Brightspace. And my office hours are in this dark red section. Uh, this semester, I'm going to Zoom all of those. So you can get to me during those times easily by Zoom. If that doesn't fit your schedule, then contact me and we can set up a, a personal meeting. Okay, that works. And just the, the motto of that story is um, don't wait till the last minute.